Um, I'm also not going to be talking about any medium or media, but rather the stellar metallicity in galaxies, mostly observations, uh, make a couple of, uh, one slide about simulations. So this work is with the, the SAGES group, and in particular my PhD student, uh, Nicola Pastorello at, at, at Swinburne University. So in terms of deriving metallicity for stars and the halos of galaxies, we can obviously do this for nearby galaxies where you can actually resolve individual stars. Of course, that work's been um, carried out here at Santa Cruz by Raj Gunther Kurter and, and others. Um, but of course, that technique only works in the very nearest <coughs> galaxies. Excuse me. So to, to, to probe the metallicity of stars further out, more distant galaxies, we have to look at integrated spectra. So that's been done over the years, typically with, with long slits. And here I sort of summarize, summarize some of the results of stellar population gradients in nearby elliptical galaxies in particular using long slits. And these typically go out to about one effective radius in a galaxy. So these works have tended to find uh, no age gradient or perhaps a slight positive one. So in other words, older as you go out in, in radius in the galaxy. Generally no alpha element gradient. So the, the alpha to ion ratio is pretty constant out to one effective radius. What you do see, of course, is very strong metallicity gradients, very strong negative declining metallicity gradients, much more metal rich in the centers of galaxies. And these inner regions, by these stellar population properties, seem to be a bit more consistent with the formation in some sort of dissipative process that, that is responsible for that very strong metallicity gradient. Now, if you look at metallicity gradients, again, within one effect of radius is a function of galaxy host mass. So there's a couple of plots here from, um, from Spilar's work. So the one, um, there's one against velocity dispersion on your, on your left here and one against the uh, absolute magnitude on the right. It's essentially the same galaxy samples but with some different coatings. And the lines represent some different models. So we've got so, uh, a merger model from, from Becky, Kawata. There's a Phil Hopkins yellow region occupied here. Um, so you can see that the data, uh, well, at least at the high mass end, is, doesn't seem to obey a particularly strong trend. But there might be some trend of at the higher mass galaxies. As you go to lower masses, you go to stronger, steeper metallicity gradients. And then possibly at some mass, that trend reverses itself for the, for the lower mass galaxies, that once they get to the very lowest masses, those gradients actually become flat. So this is what the what was known about metallicity gradients in galaxies as a function of mass at this sort of time, 2009-2010. So what you'd like to do, of course, is probe further out than one effect of radius. And because the surface brightness of the galaxy falls off you know, dramatically, it's, it's very hard, very telescope, telescope time intensive to go out beyond one effect of radius. Um, and I think, so you either spend a very large amount of time on a single long slit, and that of course only probes one position angle. You might like to do at least two position angles or even look for twists and so on. So ideally you'd like a, an integral field unit approach to map it out in two dimensions. But again, you'd like to go to large radii. Most of the integral field units around tend to be quite small today, usually about 30 arc seconds, and they tend just to probe the inner regions. So the, for example, the Sauron Atlas 3D survey had a, a mean effective radius of about 0.7 RE for the galaxies of the 270 elliptical galaxies that they studied. They went out typically to about only 0.7 RE. So although again they looked at metallicity gradients, it didn't take us further out particularly than, than the long slits can do. So Gene spoke a little bit on Monday about the Slugs survey. Here we're looking at 25 nearby elliptical <laughs> galaxies. Most of their inner regions have been probed by the Atlas 3D survey. Um, what we're doing is using the DEMOS spectrograph on Keck and effectively using it as an integral field unit, but that gives us a wider field of view. So we're probing, as well as kinematics, stellar metallicities out to about 2.5 effective radii. We're also looking at the globular clusters as traces of halos of early type galaxies, and that gets us out to about 10 effective radii. So here's just a sample of 25 pretty normal looking elliptical galaxies, some range in mass, some range in environment. 
So here's uh, one of our results for stellar metallicity maps. So on the left, you've got just the digital sky survey image of, in this case, NGC 5846 and the little galaxy below it. The next map, so if you look there, the little circles represent the slits that we have from, from Deimos, and they're color-coded by metallicity. So we actually observe um, a spectrum and get the calcium triplet lines, and the calcium triplet's very sensitive to metallicity, and then we convert that into metallicity. So those little circles are showing you individual metallicity measurements. Then we create an, an interpolated map in two dimensions using a technique called Krigging, which actually comes from the mining industry. So the nice thing about the central map, map, map here is that you can actually identify this little lower mass galaxy as having lower metallicity. It comes up nice and clearly on this, on this 2D map. So for the right-hand side, we've taken out those data points just within a, a circle around that little galaxy and then remade this 2D interpolated uh, Krig map. And you now see a, a much smoother metallicity distribution that falls off nicely from high metallicity in the center to, to lower metallicity further out. So here's the same galaxy again. Um, here's our latest uh, metallicity map. But So on the left-hand side here is showing metallicity as a function of log radius <coughs> and linear radius. So up the top is log radius. So you can see that there's one effective radius there. So the red line that you can see is the metallicity from the Sauron Atlas 3D work going out uh, to that radius there, about minus 0.3 in log effective radius. The individual colored squares are the actual data points that we have from, from Deimos. And then the black points are, is the metallicity profile that we derive from this interpolated 2D map filling in the spaces that we don't have. So I think you can see that we've got some good agreement with Sauron. And we've got a metallicity gradient, in this case, a gently sloping metallicity gradient in this galaxy, which we're seeing out to about two effective radii. No, it's not. So it's a good question. So Sauron looks in the optical, so they're getting magnesium and iron lines generally that are giving them their metallicities, and we're doing our work in, in calcium triplet. So there did, there did indeed have to be a, a calibration, if you like, between uh, ours and theirs. But, but that's only an offset, of course, so the slope is, is, is unchanged between the two works. I'll show you some more examples. So I just want to step through a few other um, galaxies that are all nearby galaxies. This is a relatively low mass galaxy, and in this case you can see it's got a very steep metallicity gradient in its, in its outer parts, going out to about two effective radii. I and mean, again, you can see, look at the 2D map. Here's our data point. So indeed, you know, we often don't probe the centers of galaxies particularly well, but that's where Sauron or Atlas 3D can come in. Again, that red line is the Atlas 3D slash Sauron metallicity profile for this galaxy. Here's another galaxy here, relatively flat gradient in this case. Uh, another galaxy with a flatter gradient. Again, sparsely sampled in this case. Another example of an elongated galaxy, so we've got lots of data points on the, on the elongation. Again, not particularly in the center. And so another preliminary result, so this is our sample of galaxies. <clears throat> the y-axis shows the um, gradient in the outer parts. That's one effective radius going out to about two and a half. Again, against galaxy mass. So in this case, the k-band absolute magnitude or the velocity dispersion. And there's our galaxies here. They're just um, color-coded by being either S0 or elliptical. So as I said, very preliminary work. But again, we see a similar kind of trend that I showed you at the beginning for the more massive galaxies. In other words, the more massive galaxies um, have relatively flat gradients, but they become steeper as you go to lower mass. It doesn't make much difference. In this case, I think it does come from, from Sauron, yeah. But it wouldn't make much difference whether we used our own or, or theirs. So there's some, well, the, so this is a, zero would represent a flat gradient. So yes, in some sense, positive represents it's actually, you know, getting more metal rich as you go further out. But you'll see some errors here and it's preliminary work. So I would actually, you know, 
uh, interpret these guys as just having flat metallicity gradients, actually. So I thought I'd just spend a minute, if I've still got a time, telling you actually a little bit more about the technique, about how we do this. So we use the DEMOS spectrograph. So here's the DEMOS slit mask on the sky. That's the elliptical galaxy there that's been masked out. We put lots of little slits on the galaxy. We actually target globular clusters. And we get a spectrum of, of a globular cluster, but, which is that line there. But what, either side of the globular cluster, that light is light coming from the galaxy halo and also from the sky. So we uh, remove the sky and we're left with just that galaxy halo light. This is one of my ex-PhD students with a DEMOS slit mask. If you've got good eyesight, you can see about 100 slits in that mask. So we tend to do a pinwheel pattern on each of our galaxies just to build up our, our sample. Uh, shifting gears a little bit now. So this is just a, an advertisement for some work that Justin Cater and Aaron Romanowski are doing. So they're extracting metallicity profiles from the violent disk simulations, Severino and Abishai Deckel and, and co. They're doing this for so far from redshifts of 5 through to 1. So they've got a, a number of galaxies over a range of redshifts and they can extract metallicity profiles. The idea of course is that we can start to compare our metallicity profiles at redshift zero for our ellipticals with, with ones predicted from this sort of violent disk uh, model of galaxy formation. But if you have any questions, I think Aaron Romaski is here. I'm sure he'll be happy to, to answer them on that one. So that was all I had to say on simulations. This is sort of our, our next step on the observational side. So returning to NGC 5846, that's all that data that I showed you before going out to around one effective radius. These red points now represent the metallicities of the red globular clusters in this galaxy. So we think red globular clusters are associated with spheroid components of galaxies. So this is one, another way to probe even further out into the halo of elliptical galaxies is by using the globular clusters as a, as a proxy. If you like the model of, of elliptical galaxies being a core and then their outer parts being accreted, so it's the accretion of dwarf galaxies, satellites, and their globular clusters that are building up the halos of, of giant elliptical galaxies. So we're pretty excited about this, this possibility too, to really get out now even out to 10 effective radii. Another way of probing the halos with globular clusters is just to look at their colors. So here I'm plotting on the left axis that's the color of individual globular clusters as a function of radius. And there's a effective radius running across the top. So you can see we're going out to almost 15 effective radii in this particular giant galaxy. So each individual black point on this plot is an individual globular cluster. And then the red and blues are the mean values of the red and the blue globular cluster subpopulations. So you can see there's some evidence for a gradient in the inner regions that perhaps flattens out uh, at larger radii. Now because globular clusters are old, their colors are essentially telling us about the metallicity. And that's what's written onto the right-hand side axis there. So for example, you can measure the mean metallicity of this flat part of the curve. These blue globular clusters have a mean metallicity of, let's say, minus 1.4. Because there's a well-known relationship between the mean metallicity of globular clusters and the mass of the host galaxy, you can convert this metallicity into a mean mass of the galaxies that have been accreted to form the halos of such galaxies. So these are my conclusions, very much um, preliminary. So as I said, it's very difficult to probe stellar populations out to large radii in galaxies, particularly with, with, with long slits. But I think it is very necessary if we want to start testing these ideas of elliptical galaxies being an in-situ core, a red nugget if you like, and then their outer halos have been built up over time by the accretion of, of dwarf galaxies and their globular clusters. So we really do need to get into the outer parts of galaxies to see this transition between the inner in-situ core and the outer accreted halo so to, to test these models. So one way of doing that, as I said, is from the, the SLUGS project. So we're looking at the 2D stellar metallicity maps and we're probing out to about two and a half effective radii with this method. And we like to extend that out to 10 effective radii using the globular clusters as a, as a proxy. 
So our preliminary results is we find quite a wide, wide range of metallicity gradients at these larger radii, and I think there's a hint of a possible correlation with, with galaxy mass that I showed you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the disadvantages, I suppose, of, with our technique is we really only essentially get metallicity. So the calcium triple is very sensitive to metallicity. It's, it's relatively insensitive to age, so we don't really get any age information. It's pretty insensitive to, the, to alpha as well. Uh, it's okay. So at this stage, basically just metallicity. Yeah, it's a good question too. So it's sort of a completely separate topic and talk. So we do have a, a paper that presented about a thousand radial velocities for globular clusters. That's another student of mine, Vince Potter. So that's published. Um, they very much looked at the kinematics of blue and red globular clusters separately, but um, we did start to see some hints that the you know that, that their colours or their metallicities might correlate with their kinematics um, in the sense of looking for substructure, right? So you can imagine. Interestingly, if you know a small object falls in, it might have different kinematics, but it might also have um, you know different chemistry, if you like, a lot different metallicity. So yes, we saw some hints of that uh, in our data. Yep. Right. Well, there's lo obviously lots of different ideas for, for forming ellipticals, right? So one of the plots I showed, you know, did have some of this, you might call older models, you know, of, of a major merger and so on. Um, Phil Hopkins is sort of, you know, gas-rich uh, mergers. He had a sort of parameter space. So in that sense, the gradients, you know, were inside that, that parameter space. Um, but I agree, I think we want to test this now with more sort of modern ideas. So. Um, Again, you know, I just showed one slide of that simulation that Justin Cater and Aaron Romanowski are doing. So they're trying to derive metallicity gradients from this, this violent disk instability idea. Um, and I know there's some work going on by the NAB, Burkett, uh, Hirschman group. And so this is the sort of you know, red nuggets you know, being accrete, you know, accreting um, you know, dwarf galaxies to their outer parts and then predicting what the metallicity gradients should be there. And I think they also find the same trend that we have in the sense that the lower mass galaxies have steeper metallicity gradients. And I think you understand that in, in the sense that the lower mass galaxies are probably accreting on or to first order lower mass dwarf galaxies. So that lowers the, their metallicity gradients. And the bigger mass galaxies are on average accreting larger mass dwarf galaxies that keeps the gradients relatively flat. So the, on the simulation side, you know, yes, these things are coming out and we're looking forward to, to testing against them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the er the errors are large, so we've been trying to do some Monte Carlo simulations to understand the, the errors. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons we sort of go to this interpolation technique is to try to sort of, you know, smooth over any potential individual, uh, you know, data points that, that, that might be deviant. Um, and again, also then try to understand how that interpolation technique, where it works and where it, where it fails. Clearly, if we don't have any data points, like in the center, it's just going to, you know, try to fit something smooth, but it's, it's you know, not realistic because we don't have any constraints in there. So there are limitations to, to our technique. I mean, to, to follow on Anatoly's question, mm. are you saying that, you know, because you see this very large scatter, so you think that most of that scatter is observational error? I think so, yeah, that's right. So you see that, you know, most of those error bars were fairly large. They're, they're probably consistent with the scatter, but in the mean, and as you saw too, 
in the inner parts where we did have some overlap with other surveys that are done at different wavelengths, we had pretty good agreement in terms of the slope of Sauron Atlas 3D, again, in the mean. Yeah, we don't have, you know, you saw sort of a huge amount of sampling, and particularly if, if it is an elongated galaxy, we've tended just to get the sampling along the major axis, so it's very hard to do that. Our sampling is, is, is limited, but in the few cases that we've tried to do that, it, it looks pretty consistent. We can extract, you know, virtual slits from the, the interpolated map, and when we do that, the, the major and minor axes are, are very consistent.